is 4143 to 131 or it's 1346 How did you end up in the Navy? Well, I was too sin to enlist in the Army. They wouldn't take me, so they finally settled for the Navy, and they took me because I was underweight and I uh, fit their qualifications. How much did you weigh? I weighed about 105, 10 pounds. Wow. So the Army drafted you, but then they wouldn't take you? Yeah. So they, then you enlisted in the Navy? Well, they... Uh, well, the Army they, sent you over there. They, yeah, they sent me over there, but they didn't take me at first because, I, like I said, I was underweight and they wanted me to put on weight. So I went back home and I worked in the machine as a machinist, machinist and... And I got a second notice, draft notice, and I was I, I had a report to Hartford, Connecticut, and when I got there, they took me, but it was kind of un, un, unsettled. The the idea of me being in, in the navy was too much for them because my weight and my qualifications but they took me anyway in the Navy and I was, that's when I was drafted. Uh -huh, into the Navy. Where were you living at the time? New Britain? Yeah, I was working in New Britain machine. Once uh, you actually joined the Navy, where did you go? Well, I went to boot camp. It was uh, where? Uh, uh, oh boy, <laughs> Geneva, New York. Do you remember uh, how long? Well, I I I was just there, maybe. I don't know. I I forget. <laughs> Do you remember anything about boot camp? What was it like? Well, it was very cold there, and you know, the barracks were two uh, two stories high, and they uh, they held uh, ten thousand men, wow. ten thousand sailors in each unit, and there in was each barracks. No, no. Each unit, you know, unit was a, a unit was a, a whole company of sailors. Okay, a whole company. And how many companies were there? There must have been ten. Oh wow! Oh yeah, there was a, over a hundred thousand. And we had to march with our sea bags. And we marched all around the unit, and uh, we finally got discharged, and we we were sent home for boot, from boot camp. We were sent home. I'm sorry, but I don't remember too much, you know. That's okay. It's been a long time. But, so uh, after your boot camp, you went home on leave for a little I while? I went home on leave, and I uh, I went and met my wife, and we had uh, a little get-together. And Were you married at the time? No, I wasn't. You were just we dating waited, your wife. We waited until after, if I came back. Oh. See, because I was... I, w I was in a unit uh, in the Navy where we uh, 
we were under the command of uh, Admiral Nimitz, and we were on a fast-moving uh, fleet of ships, which, well, we were a slow ship, but we were in every engagement that, that went on there. Do you remember any of your instructors from boot camp? Uh, well, I, I remember some of them, but I don't remember the, their names. Do you have any memorable experiences from boot camp? No. Oh, you mean uh, what I did in boot yes. camp? Yes. Well, I remember Lake Geneva, which we were training around the, the, the lake, and... Uh, it was a deep lake, a very deep lake, and we we did a lot of calisthenics around there, you know, just to keep warm. <laughs> it was so cold there. Wow. And, uh, oh yeah, uh, uh, another thing, we, we had the cleanest barracks. We had the cleanest barracks in the unit there, and... They gave us liber liberty in Lake Geneva, New York. We won the Red Rooster, they call it. Wow. That's what I remember about the, the Navy. We won the Red Rooster, which was the our unit won the cleanest. Uh, the cleanest barracks in the place. Yeah. So your reward was liberty in They, they gave us labor, liberty in Lake Geneva, New York. What did you do on your liberty? Well, we we were we were uh, engaged in uh, looking around town and seeing it. It was uh, something that we were witnessing that. Uh, Well, I, I just can't, I can't remember everything, but I know that we had a good time. We had a very good time, and the people treated us like kings. <laughs> after your leave at home, after boot camp and you went home on leave, where did you go after that? Oh, Okay, after boot camp, I parted, my, my wife and I parted, and I went to Washington, D.C. What did you do there? Well, there I, there I was transferred to, to the, uh, the amphibious base. In Washington? Yes, in uh, Solomon's, Maryland. Down just below Washington, it was Solomon's, Maryland, and I was training to be an amphibious sailor. I was training to uh, overhaul engines, you know, uh, uh, diesel engines. I was Did you learning. know anything about working on diesel engines? No, I didn't know nothing. Oh, so they were teaching you all that? Yeah, they were teaching me there. Was that going to be your job as the... Well, that led up to my job. See, from there on, we went down to Solomon's, Maryland, which was a, a Little Creek Amphibious Training Base. I was, we, went, we went on an LST, which was landing ship tanks. We went on number seven. I remember that number. Number seven. That was your training, LST. You're right. And we went out to the South the Atlantic. We went down to um, oh, it was near uh, North Carolina. How long was your training in Maryland? How long? Yes. 
I would say about two months. And in that two months, they taught you mechanic work? What yeah, else? They taught me mechanic. Oh, pardon me. I think that was two or three months. Okay. And uh, it, they t taught me uh, mechanical work and stuff like that. And then my captain, the captain on our ship, told me, told everybody they had called for a muster, a muster card, a call, and he wanted to know uh, if anybody would volunteer to be a small boat operator and nobody volunteered. So he says, well, I'll have to look through the records to see how, what all you fellows did. But nobody worked on anything except me and another fellow. We worked on machines. So the captain says, Mr. D'Amico, you're a small boat operator which is LCVP. LCVP? Yeah, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. And he says, you think you can run that boat? I says, sure, Captain. I can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so he put me on the boat, and I circled the boat, and, I, and he said, all right, now you have to show this other guy how to run it. So I had to show him how to run it. But all during the invasions, I was always up in front. Uh, they always, the Admiral Turner noticed, took a notice of me, and he had me uh, complete his command. Well, so now that you've got assigned to this LCVP, did that become your new job? Yes. And it was that your job for the rest of the war? The rest of the war. So you became an expert now. Ex now, what was your job on board the ship? Oh, I was. Uh, I worked in the main engine room. I, uh, when I'm free on board ship, I uh, stood watches in the main engine room. That's what's, what's uh, operating the engines. You know, under was that a while. Diesel uh, engine? Huh? Was Dies that diesel? Diesel engine. Now, how big was an LCVP? What can you tell me about? Well, uh, it's a landing craft, and it held 36 Marines, fully armed Marines. And I transported them to, uh, to the island, the invasions. I, I was. Uh, I had five battle stars, which battle stars meant five invasions, which was one was Saipan, the first one was Saipan, with the second Marine Division. I brought the second Marine Division in, and I brought the wounded to the hospital ships. The second one was Tinyan. Saipan Tinian, which was an island next next to Saipan, and I uh, experienced. I had a lot of experience there with uh, life and death. It was it was uh, witnessing a lot of killings and stuff like that, you know, and I I had. Uh, I had uh, taken the Marines into the island and uh, and followed up with them. I was in the actual battle of the, uh, the kamikaze uh, Japanese who pulled a banzai raid on us. And a lot of people were killed. And I experienced a lot of death. And I also took the, the, the wounded off the island 
and uh, the badly, badly uh, mauled Marines. I took them back to uh, safer areas on the island. I also was a, a, a see, I, if, if it's only this years ago, I would have told you right away. That's all right. We'll take our, we'll work up to that. When you were in, after you got trained in Maryland, and you were put on the LCVP, where did you go from there? Well, we went uh, to pick up my ship, it was LST-278. LST-278? LST yeah. That was your landing, ship? Landing ship tanks. Did that become your ship for the rest of the war? That was one of them, but I lost that in one battle oh. in the South Pacific. All right, when you picked up LST-278, where did you go? Well, I, we went to... Uh, Mer um, oh, see, how oh, it was, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What did you do there? Grave Old Corporation in, uh, in the river there in Pittsburgh. I picked up my ship and we went down the Allegheny River, Ohio, Mississippi River to New Orleans on the LST-278. So we wound up in, in New Orleans and we had our mask put on down there because they wanted to hold the ship so as low as possible while we were going through 42 locks to New Orleans. And we got to New Orleans and we were outfitted with uh, with a mast, you know, a mast, uh -huh. and uh, we went to we went to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and then to Panama City, Florida, and then we went to Mobile, Alabama, because we put a we were training landing. And we put a hole in the bottom of the ship. How did you do that? Well, landing, we hit a rock. See, the ship was a, a low draft. It didn't take much of a draft, but it was too, too, too high. That rock that we hit was too high, and we put a hole in our bottom. So we had to go to Mobile, Alabama, and dry docks to have that repaired and uh, we repaired it and we went back out to sea. We went to uh, Guantanamo Bay again and from there on we went down through the Panama Canal out to uh, the Pacific Ocean. And Did you know at that time where you were heading? Yes, we were going to the South Pacific. And you knew that? We knew that. How long did it take you to cross the ocean? Well, first of all, we had a train on the way up the uh, out there. In other words, we went from there to San Diego, California, and... We trained with the 2nd Marine Division. We pulled them up to uh, an island there right off of the, right off of the uh, California coast. And it was an island we were training. We were bombarding the island and going in for a landing with the Marines. I took the Marines in to to show them, you know, how to land and everything. And from then on, we went to, uh, we went to, you want to know everything on that? Yep. Well, 
we went up to uh, after landing Marines there and showing them. We went up to uh, San Francisco, the Dravo Corporation in San Francisco, and we had a load on uh, live ammunition in the Dravo Corporation for the Pacific Command. In other words, we we were loading different various ships with high explosive and no smoking. The smoking lamp was out and we would load them up for the, for the Pacific invasions. And then we left San Francisco for Pearl Harbor. Now we knew that something was going on. Admiral Nimitz needed us out in the South Pacific. And he used us what they call island hopping. We so you island. went, did you stop at Pearl Harbor? Well, I, we did stop, but was, there was a big accident in there. The ships blew up. The ships blew up. And we couldn't go in there. The, the, uh, in other words, the command sent us out, and they said, put us on a, another flotilla. A flotilla was uh, 12 LSTs, and the command of one, one commander. Who was the, your commander of your flotilla? My commander was Black. B L A C K. So, because the ships blew up in Pearl Harbor, did you actually dock at Pearl Harbor, or no? You had to keep. Well, going? not at that time. No, later on we did. Okay, so did you still have L S T two seven eight? Yep. So you now are under Commander Black in this flotilla. Right. And where did and you were? Did you know you were going to go island hopping? Well, I didn't know that. No. Until we we went to uh, we went to the invasion of Saipan. All right. So you from Pearl Harbor, then you headed right over to Saipan. Yeah. Well, we 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 anchored in Anna We Talk. Anna We Talk was a, an island by itself. Uh, the, so now, what date are we? Do you know what year that was? That was 1943. All right, so you you anchored in any we talk, and then did all of the LSTs go out together for the invasion yeah, of Yeah, we, we yeah we all we all went to the invasion of Saipan. Did you know that that's what you were heading out to do? No, I didn't. What did you think you were going to do? Just deliver? People? I thought I was going to Guam. Oh. But they diverted us. To Saipan. Now, did your LST were you were they were you carrying thirty six Marines on board? Well, on a, on a small boat, on a small boat, the the boat carried the LST carried about four hundred and fifty Marines. Oh, so that's how many you had on board? No, well, we had on a on a LST. There's this landing shift tanks. Now, which one did you take to Saipan, the LST or the other little one? Well, I was on both of them. Oh. I, w I was attached to to one seizure on a main deck. They had two small boats, which carried L LCVPs, two LCVPs. And I manned one, and another man manned the other one. Oh, were those little boats, those LCDs on board the LSD? You're yeah, right. They were up in oh. the Davids. Oh. They lowered them into the drink. They call them the drink or the water. And then we we would take the Marines on board down a rope ladder. They'd come down the ladder and jump in my boat. And I'd take them into the beach. You know, go back and get another load and another load till you empty the LST. Oh. 
See what I mean? Yep. So on Saipan, what did you discover? What was Saipan like? That was your first invasion and that was your that first That was my first, time. first invasion. What was that like? Do you recall that? Well, it was kind of hairy because kind of scary, you know. I bet. Well, it was until I got used to it and everybody everybody was was getting used to it and they were <laughs> more or less uh, they had to go through it. We had to do it. So how long did it take you going back and forth from the LST to shore? Oh, maybe half hour. When I brought the troops in, I went back after another load and go back, back and forth. The same with the other boat, the other small boat did the same thing. You know, both of us. Which division of the Marines were you ferrying to the shore? Which? Yes. The combat. The Was combat this? units. Frontline Marines. Do you remember anything else from the invasion of Saipan? Well, I, I remember a lot of things. But because uh, I, I was assigned to blow up these uh, star mines, they call them. Uh, and uh, when I see them floating in the water, they float towards a big ship and they blow it up. But uh, my job was to blow that star, uh, start that, uh, shoot that star line and try to blow it up. And what was it called? A star mine? The star mine, yeah. Did it look like a star? Yeah, it looked like a star. And uh, the Japs uh, would, uh, would have them anchored on the bottom of the, bo uh, the bay and they'd let them loose and they'd float up and they'd float into a uh, no, uh, uh, any kind of a landing craft or uh, anything that was was a, in the war zone, you know. And any you would have to shoot the them ship. to blow them up. Yeah, to blow up the ships in harbor. That had to be pretty scary too, because if you missed any, it would hit your own boat. Oh yes. That that ship, when 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 you shoot the, I had an old three rifle which was, a nineteen eighteen, a bolt action rifle, uh, and I, and I used to practice you know shoot, and blow up the mines. Were you a good shot? Oh yeah, <laughs> I was a good shot then. Yeah. All right, so after Saipan, where did you go? We went to Tinian. Now, was this shortly after? Yeah, it was 30 days after we invaded Saipan. I, I, I had a, well, before the, we invaded, uh, we invaded uh, Tinian, uh, I was assigned the, uh, the Navy, uh, the Marine Corps had me take this, this interpreter, Japanese interpreter. He came down on a uh, PBY, uh, per, uh, Navy patrol plane. Uh, water, it landed in the water, and he had me bring him this uh, interpreter. He was a Japanese, but from Hawaii. And he had me bring him over to this Point Bolo, which was uh, the Japanese were surrendering there. And they were shooting, they were killing each other. Instead of surrendering, 
some would shoot each other or blow each other up, you know, and they would throw these people off this ledge, which was a couple hundred feet high in the mountain, and they threw them off the mountain. And I was over there, I had them, this interpreter with the, with the loudspeaker yelling in Japanese, don't, don't, uh, try pleading with the army, the Japanese, uh, army pleading with them not to kill the, the civilians. And they would take them and throw the men, women, and children off the mountain into the, the drink, what they call the drink. And as soon as they hit the bottom, they were dead. You know, men, women, and children. And after, when when they were, they were floating in there for about a day, that that I was working there, uh, pleading with them and having the the man the interpreter trying to save their lives, but then uh, when the the Japs landed and you know they were dead and floating around there. Then the flies started getting on them, big green flies, and they were all over my face and everything, and biting me. I had to get out of there, so I I was a boat operator, so I gunned it and I went back towards the Garapan. Garapan is the uh, 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 capital of Saipan, Garapan. I think it was that Garapan. Yeah. But anyway, I uh, I did my job there, trying to save the, whoever we could, and I went back and put the guy in a PBY, and he flew back to Hawaii this interpreter. And then you prepared for the invasion of Kenya? Then I went to the invasion of Kenya. Did you know where you were going at that time? No. Oh, well, well before they came, I was I was there working with the, with the underwater demolition. The men that were, they just started that team, the, the demolition experts working underwater, and I worked with them. I was training with them. Now, so in it, between Saipan and Tinian, did were you still anchored at any Weetok? And a Weetok? No. So where were you now? And a Weetok is, is 1,500 miles away. Oh, geez. Well, you're far. So where did you anchor after Saipan? We anchored right there in the harbor there. Oh, so you didn't go anywhere. No, right there. You stood right there. You you um, you had to work with the Marines and the Navy, Navy um, UDT, underwater demolition teams. You work with them, and then I I, la I landed the second, the fourth Marine Division, part of the fourth Marine Division. On Tinian. What do you remember about that invasion? Well, I, I remember it wasn't very wide of a of a landing because they uh, fooled the, fooled the Japs. They didn't. The Japs ex expected us to land on one side of the island, and we did the opposite. If we landed on their side, they would have us. They would have killed us all. But we landed on, on a on a, a given side of the island, like uh, uh, the, the commanders. They figured that they fooled the Japs by making us land in this area, so we could uh, capture the island faster, and that we did. And that that was a very very important island during World War Two was Tinian. 
Pyongyang was an army air base. They quickly f formed it into a extreme air base. Extreme army air base. And that's what we were bombing Japan with from Tinian. Now, from, from Tinian, we went to Peleliu. But first of all, we went down to, down to the island of, uh, uh, oh, gee, see, I, I forget a lot of Anyway, we went to this island where, where, where the, uh, the Japs pulled a raid. They uh, sunk a lot of American destroyers and battle wagons, battleships. They, they pulled a raid. Oh, Iron Bottom, they call that. Is what they call the island? It's an island, yeah. It's a, a rock island it's sticking out. Uh, the ocean, and uh, the Japs come down and circle that island, and they caught the Americans sleeping in the battleships, and they sunk them battleships. They they went through there, and they were firing their guns, and they were just killing the American sailors and sinking the ships, and they they were even in their their bed sleeping while the the Japs circled the island and sunk the sunk the, the American ships. Now, what was your job to go there? Well, my job was just just to go there to pick up the uh, the first Marine Division. This is another division. Okay, so you picked up the first Marine Division there. And then headed to Peleliu. We ha held. We headed for Peleliu. Peleliu. P e l l i l u. Okay. Now, I'm guessing Peleliu was your third battle star. The third battle star. And that's where I lost my ship. We had an abandoned ship. Because. This, you lost which ship, that little one, the yellow The L LST, the big one. Oh, how did that happen? Well, we, we, uh, we were under fire, we were under fire from the Japanese 17-inch uh, guns. They were firing at us and almost hit us. But in the meantime, we were... We were, uh, we were in the harbor like that. It was, it was, uh, it was an area which was just close to the shore. And, uh, and the, the enemy fire was on top of us and we were, we didn't know when we were going to get hit. We didn't get hit. It's just the idea that a gale storm blew up and, it rocked us off the causeway. The causeway was uh, was the pontoons that, that or the CBs put over there for us to land troops on and drive to the beach. But we couldn't do that because the, the typhoon blew up. And it just devastated all everything that was put on the island, and we we, we were just at the mercy of the Japanese. We had to put put all the Marines we could get on the island because they were getting killed, and they were. I think the first Marine division ceased to exist because the, the army had to take over their command because the Marines lost so many people. And uh, I was up there in the front lines with the Marines. 
because uh, my my crew they abandoned ship and uh, they they went into the island and they lived in a big tent. Did you go with them? No, I couldn't. I couldn't. I was with I was with the Marines. So you had to stay there. I had to stay with the Marines. I knew how to fight like a Marine, so I stood there, and uh, we were. So actually, the LST was wrecked from the typhoon, or the Japanese bombing. What do you think? Well, then actually, we got sunk by the typhoon. The typhoon wrapped us, rammed us up against the beach in another LST and put a big hole in it on the side of the ship and it just flooded the main engine room or auxiliary engine room and but it's still we see on an LST if you have to dog all the hatches in other words, lock all the hatches through the passageways, port and starboard, and that would hold the ship from sinking because it would hold the buoyancy like a floating duck. So it was it was floating, but later on the sea bees after the the storm. The sea bees refloated the ship, and they welded the uh, plates on it to to make it buoyancy. And they floated it up, and it was used as a post office. <laughs> they used it as a post office in Guam. Hey, but they kept it floating, huh? Yeah, they floated it. They. Mm -hmm. So then your whole crew got to go... The, my crew went into the island of uh, uh, Gar Garapan. No. No, because now you're at Pelulu. Pelulu, right? yeah. And then, well, there was a little island there that they went in and they were they were there until the army took over the, the command. All right, so now you stayed with the Marines and what was your job? Well, I I had to go back to uh, oh, oh wait a minute. The, the the captain told us uh, what he, after after we met the the people they he asked us if we wanted to go on another LST but nobody wanted it so anyway. They said, "What do you want to vote? What do you want to get on?" Well, I said, "I was training how to be an underwater demolition man," and I said, "I wanted to go on on the uh, as a training." So they sent me over to Tinian again with uh, six guys, six sailors. We all volunteered for. UDT, underwater demolition. So we, they flew us from Tinian to uh, Hickam Field, Honolulu, Honolulu, and that was over 3,500 miles away. So you trained for UDT in Honolulu? Yeah. How long did that take? Well, uh, I, all I trained for was not that I chickened out. It's the idea is I couldn't get the water out of my ear. I didn't know that I blew up my ear, my eardrum, on Pelulu. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, Pelulu. I injured my ear drum, and I think I blew out my eardrum over there. I couldn't get the water out of my ear, and it drove me nuts. I tried to get a doctor. I wanted a doctor, and I couldn't get one. And 
So they put me on a uh, whole, oh, 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 I forgot the name of that, the big island of Hawaii. Oahu? Oahu. They put me on Oahu waiting for the uh, uh, ear doctor. And none ever showed up. So in the meantime, my ear dried up and I was okay. But my ear was damaged and I still couldn't see a doctor. I needed a doctor. In other words, I couldn't see a doctor because they were all on the aircraft carriers. So oh. did that end your underwater demolition training? Well, I was. I was there, but I had to... I had to disembark of, uh, from that training area. I had to get out of that outfit. In other words, the captain told me, you'll have to go back to Pearl Harbor to see a doctor. So they sent me over to Pearl Harbor. But they did. I didn't see no doctor. There was no no doctor there to see. So they put me on another LST. Which number LST this time? This time it was three ninety nine. And where did you go on LST? Three ninety nine. Three ninety nine. LST three ninety nine. Where did you go on that LST? I went to. We're going out to the. To uh, Iwo Jima. Oh, so is this you're going to be your fourth battle star? Yeah. Did you know you were going to Iwo Jima? No. You never know where you're going, huh? No. Everything was a secret. Uh, we went out to, in fact, we went to uh, Saipan from uh, from Pearl Harbor. Yeah. I got on the ship. We went out. We were going to Saipan. And the captain told me, he says, Danico, uh, you're, you're a small boat operator. You're, uh, you run the LCVPs? I says, yep. He says, well, you man that boat. So I had, had to man the boat. So on DJH hour in Saip, uh, in Iwo Jima, <laughs> I got so many of them. I had to uh, take the Marines into the beach on DJH hour. DJH hour on Iwo Jima? Yep. You manned that LCVP? Yeah, I took the LCVP. We took in, uh, we had a, a circle the we had a circle of the command ship, which was Admiral Turner. Admiral Kelly B. Turner was our commanding officer. And he had us circle uh, the two LCVPs from my ship. We had a circle, uh, the, uh, an APA. An APA is a landing uh, amphibious cargo ship more or less, and they had to cut, cut down, uh, come down boat rope ladders into the well deck of my boat, and then we brought them in the island, and we did likewise back and forth all day long for, on DJH hour, and that's when we were getting hit. We had, There was over 8,000 8,000 casualties on the island. I forgot how much it was. So you did that for how long? All day. All day. I, then, then I had to bring in ammunition, for, for small arms ammunition for them. And 
in the meantime, my beach, my beach, I couldn't land my couldn't land on my beach because it was bombarded too too hard, and I had to hold off away from the island a little bit. In the meantime, the Japs were were shelling us with five-inch shells, you know. 16 inch shells, not 16, but 5 inch shells and motor fire, and they were peppering the heck out of it. Alright, Albert, we left off at uh, the invasion of Iwo Jima, but I know uh, you also had somebody else in one of your trips to shore. I your son talked to me off camera. I guess you had Joe Rosenthal on one of your trips. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, that was on Iwo Jima. And that's where we are now, on Iwo Jima. Well, see, I was on my boat doing my job, and Joe Rosenthal come in with an APA, um, Associated Press boat, which was the same as a LCVP, but he had uh, he had the the Navy gave the, the press preference over the all everybody else. But you know the in other words, the Associated Press men had preference over everybody. So this uh, Joe Rosenthal uh, come by with his boat and he asked me if, if he could jump on my boat to uh, he wanted to take pictures of uh, men landing off of my boat you know went my ramp down and uh, he, he would take pictures of the men the Marines leaving my boat and what happened was these three six or there were six guys that I picked up off of a special boat off the uh, the ramp and put them on my boat and they they went in they were uh, uh, they were assigned to raise the flag on Iwo Jima. You had those six guys in your boat. They were in my boat. They were actually honest. I could say. Wow. Because the way they were dressed, I knew how uh, who they were, and they told me that they they were going up the hill. And Joe Rosenthal had me in his camera, in his box camera. He was taking pictures of me with the guys, you know, bring, bringing them in, and you could see me driving. My, my, uh, my boat. And for the record, uh, Albert does have pictures of that which will accompany this videotaped interview. Do I have pictures? Yes, I think your son said you do. Oh, okay. Yeah, you got pictures of that. Right. So you got to meet those famous people who raised the flag uh, at Iwo Jima. You well, actually we were all there. We were all fighting, but I'm I'm positive that I I was I brought them in because uh, you could see in that tape when when I they weren't weren't supposed to take that picture of me, but they did, and Joe Rosenthal was the only one that took that picture of me because I know he took it, you know. Yep. All right, so now we're done with Iwo Jima. Where did you go after that? In Iwo Jima, we went to Okinawa. You went directly from Iwo Jima to Okinawa? Well, no, not directly. We had to go to, we had to go to Leyte in the Philippines. Okay, so you went to Leyte. Leyte. And what yeah. did, you, did you uh, just have a stop over there? Were you involved in? Well, we had to pick up the the. It's part of the 6th Marine Division, which was the first 
in the army for the invasion of Iwo uh, Okinawa. Did you stay for very long at Lakey or just to pick up those? Not too long, maybe three weeks in all. Let's see. I think it was two or three weeks that we had to load up and get ready. We were all combat hardened uh, men in the outfit, so when we picked them up, we were ready for battle. And this was the 1st Marine Division? Yeah. And some Army guys too? Yeah. And, and now we, you're still with LST-399? Yeah, right. Is that where you stayed on that boat for the rest of the war? Right. Okay. All right, so after you picked them up in Lady, you headed to Okinawa? Okinawa, right. Did you realize that you were going into that invasion too? Well, we didn't know which battle we were going into because they thought, I, I thought I was going into uh, China. And I didn't know where we were going. We were just going somewhere. All right, so the Battle of Okinawa was your fifth battle star. Fifth then. battle. Wow. All right, what was the Battle of Okinawa like? It was very, very rough. It had kamikaze planes coming in and bombarding us. Was that the first time you had seen the kamikazes? Yeah. Well, actually, no, I saw some kamikaze uh, off the island of Pilbara, but this was before the invasion, you know. But uh, the, the kamikaze was bombarding and sinking our ships left and right. And every time uh, a kamikaze would land, he would, well, he, he would destroy himself too. He's committing suicide because it, it was suicide. And uh, they were, we were under constant uh, general quarters, they call it general quarters. You know, we had general quarters until oh what a time general quarters was air raids like the air raids the Japanese were bombarding us dive bombing us and it was we were under constant air raids you know and we did as best best we could, but like I said, I could have told you this here in one one phrase if I if I was in my right mind. Now I'm 83 years old, and it's hard for me to to remember. You know. That's okay. What else do you remember about that battle for Okinawa? Well, I was, it was really rough and because we were under constant uh, attacks from the Japs. They were attacking us every day, day and night, and they wouldn't let us sleep. In other words, we, we were up all night and all day, and some of us fell asleep. Well, well, on our, our, our guns, our, our anti-aircraft guns. I was a, a pointer and trainer on a 40 millimeter, a twin, twin gun, shooting at the Japs. It was an anti-aircraft gun. Yeah, anti-aircraft. So yeah. in between ferrying the men to shore, that's you would man the anti-aircraft gun. Yeah, because there was no invasion. There, we were, we were trying to dodge the Japanese from from sinking us. But we had to shoot them with with our 
40 millimeters. After the battle for Okinawa, where did you go? After that, we went back to the Philippine Islands. How long did you stay there? Oh, oh, wait a minute. We went to, to Subic Bay, Manila. And what yeah. did you do there? Well, we're starting to train again for the invasion of Japan. Japan. Wow. Is that where you were when you heard that the war ended? Yeah. Do you I remember was... where you were exactly when you heard that the war ended? Well, we were on some island somewhere. I forgot the name of the island. But we were on this island and we were training. Actually, we were, the war wasn't over yet, but well, a while, I guess, uh, President Roosevelt died, and what happened was Truman, was it Truman? Harry Truman got to be president, and he, he had the, the atomic bomb land on Japan, and they the, the Japs still didn't want to surrender, but they did later on. The, when oh, you were in the Philippines, did you hear about the atomic bomb being draft, dropped? Yeah. What was the reaction? Well, I, I didn't think that they uh, uh, surrendered so fast, but when they did, then the war was over. You know, we uh, we just uh, celebrated that the Japanese surrendered. All right, Albert, I'm going to ask you some questions about daily life uh, while you were in the service. How did you stay in touch with your family? Through writing. Even though you were all, you didn't seem to be landed in any place for very long. So even though you were traveling all around on these uh, LSTs, you could write. How was the mail service? The mail service was very slow. It took three months. I didn't get a letter in three months. Oh wow! One time. What was the food like? Food was excellent. Navy always had good food. Really? You have a dining hall right on board? Oh, we had a mess hall about the size of this this room with chairs and tables. It looked like uh, had part of the crew ate one time, then the next time, you know, part of the crew at a time. Did you always have plenty of supplies and materials that you needed, or were there shortages? No, we always had supplies. I ne we never had any problem with food. How about we, other materials? Did you always have sufficient supplies of all the other things? Clothing and ammunition oh, yeah. and that kind of stuff? We had plenty of that. Never had any trouble with that. Did you feel any pressure or stress on the job? Well, you were in a pretty dangerous job almost the entire war. I was. Um, how did you handle the stress from that, from combat? I took it normally, but except for my hearing, now I'm deaf from the, from the war. And I'm getting 50% uh, disability through the service, service connected, connected, connect, connected, and I, I'm making out pretty good, but it, it drives me nuts now, my hearing, because I can't hear very good, and That's because of all, all those bombings and all that noise when you were in the service. I know. 
Did you do anything special for good luck? Uh, nothing. I never had any good luck. <laughs> well, you got the luck to go to all the major invasions. Uh, that's it. And now I'm suffering from it. So it wasn't so in my good. old age. Uh, if, if I could only hear... You'd be happy? I'd be happy. How did people entertain themselves? What did you do for entertainment? Oh, well, well we... Entertainment, I... I tried to fish. I tried fishing. Did you catch anything? I caught some, yeah. I, I had certain rods and reels that I used. And I caught fish. That's about all I could do. Did you get to see any USO shows? Oh, yeah. Which one? Yeah. Do you remember? Uh, Bob Hope. You got to see Bob Hope? Bob Hope. Where? I saw him in New Guinea. You didn't tell me you were in New Guinea. When were you in New Guinea? Well, I didn't. Uh, I, you asked me about invasion. So when were you in New Guinea? I was in New Guinea when we went to a rest camp. We went to a rest camp in, in Dutch Hollandia, New Guinea. It was a Japanese camp, but the Australians invaded it and drove the Japs out of it. And then the, the Americans, uh, what do they call that, CB, C, CPOs? American, uh, actresses. With Bob Hope, they came to the island. USO. USO, yeah. So you got to see that show there? Yeah. Did you see any other USO shows while you were overseas? No, no really no. Because we were always in combat, you know. Yes, it seems like it. Did you ever get any leave? Well, you said you got that hmm. one, t one rest camp that you No, went never leave. got a leave. The whole time you were overseas? Never got to leave, no. Always in combat, and always under stress and strain. Did you get to travel anywhere else when you were in the service? Did you see any of these other places other than in combat? No. Can you recall any particularly humorous situations or unusual events while you were in the service? Like what, for instance? Like, did you guys ever play pranks on each other? Put what? Did you play jokes on each other ever? Oh, yeah, we used to always play jokes on each other. Yeah. Just to keep humorous. What did you think of the officers? Oh, some of them were good, and some of them were real bad. I had one officer, his name was Moorhead, and he gave me a hard time. He just didn't like me. He's just an officer that you got to talk to that didn't like you. And... He did everything he can to to make it rough for me. Where were you serving when you had Moorhead for an officer? That was he was on a three ninety nine. Oh. He was the officer on a three ninety nine. And he went by the books. In other words, he didn't give nobody a chance. He went by the books when he was commanding us. He went by the Navy regulation, which the Navy always kind of looked the other way, you know, 
when things got rough, and he led it up to the the men. In other words, we we took to uh, we took it as as right. What did you think of your fellow sailors? Oh, they were all good. I never had any trouble with, except a couple of them. I uh, <clears throat> I got in arguments with some sometimes, and you know, but we let it go at that. Did you keep a personal diary? While you were in the service? No. Didn't have time to. Uh, no, it certainly doesn't sound like it. Your service was very active. But um, I know you have several photographs that we'll put with your record. Oh, you know what? I did have, I had a, I had a girlfriend on Okinawa. You did? Yeah. And her name was Juana. Her name was Juana. And she used to say to me, me wife, you husband, me wanna. And she wanted to marry me. But I said, I got a, I got a girlfriend at home and I'm going to get married. In fact, she, she was looking for me to come in the island of, of uh, Okinawa. There was a, a little island off Okinawa which... Gee, now I forgot. Oh, Aishima. It's called Aishima. It, oh, that was a, a, a... We used to try to uh, last through this uh, Texan was uh, was with me. And he was a last... He used a lasso. We, we had plenty of rope, the Navy. So he... he made us uh, both a, a, a rope lasso and we tried to lasso these uh, ponies, island ponies from Aishima and we were going to bring them home. We were going to put them on the tank deck which was, well the war was over so we, we put, instead of steel we put a plywood on the floor and, and, uh, on, the, on the ship so we could take the, the ponies. The captain was going to let you take ponies back to the United States? They, w they wanted to, but they stopped it. Oh. They stopped us. We bought it. We, we caught the ponies and we let them back on the island of Okinawa. And the Japanese must have ate them. Wow. Hey, so you learned how to use a lasso while you were in there? The Texans taught you guys how to lasso everything? Yeah. All right, you were in the Philippines when the war ended. How long did you stay there before they actually then shipped you home? Well, I was in the Philippines and they sent us back to Okinawa and there was a big aircraft carrier USS Ticonderoga that was the aircraft carrier and I boarded they they told me that I, I was going home and I was in death death in one ear and all I could do was if I understood you I have to face you like this and they sent me home on the aircraft carrier. Took three weeks to get home. Oh my! That's almost ten thousand miles. From and this home. was on the USS Ticonderoga. Right. Where did you land in the United States? Seattle, Washington. And then were you discharged from the service in Seattle? No, I was sent to. Uh, Long Island, New York. I was on the troop train from Seattle, Washington, 
over to True Butte, Montana, and up to Canada, and down the other side of Canada, down uh, through Maine, and then down right through here. I come down from Maine, and uh, then Maine, then I got on the New York New Haven Hartford Railroad down to uh, Long Island. Long Island, New York. Well, that must have taken quite a while on a troop train going all that way. Yeah, long. it did. Then were you discharged from Long Island? Yeah. Do you recall your last day in service? Well, they wanted to send me to a doctor in New York, an air doctor, and the fellows were telling me, don't go over there, they only give you a bunch of, uh, a lot of uh, talk about get, seeing a doctor, and he says, you're going to wind up, you're going to go home without seeing the doctor. Well, they said, your best bet is to forget it and, and go about your way. Well, that's what I did. So they discharged you and you just went right home to Connecticut? Yeah. Back to New Britain? Yeah, right. Did you stay in touch with any of your friends from the service? Oh, yeah. Who, how many? Oh, three or four. I, I, I was going on, uh, I can't do that no more because I'm on dialysis. I can't go uh, with my friends anymore. But I have several of them on the LST. The $3.99? I, I got the names uh, in the books there. Have you attended any reunions? Yes. We were going right right along, my wife and I. We went, went to several reunions. And is this reunions for the LSTs? Yeah. Which one, the 399 or the 278? Well, both of them. Were the same men that were on the 278? Right. Um, they transferred to the 399? No, no, they were... They were... They were transferred different, different uh, ships. Were there any guys that you went in with that you stayed with through the whole time? No, well, uh, I, I didn't stay. Well, the first ship was the 278, and all of those guys just were separated from me. Then I got on 399, and I stood with them until the end. And then after the war, we got together. The 278 and the 399, you know? Yeah. But yeah. now I can't do that anymore. So you don't go to any reunions? No. What did you do in the days and the weeks immediately following your discharge? Well, all I did was work. So you came back and took the job you were in before the yeah. war? Which was where? New Burt Machine. Then I went to, I quit New Burt Machine because they were giving me a hard time. And I went to Pratt Whitney. I worked for Pratt Whitney for 32 and a half years. I was a... For 32 and a half years and then you retired? Well, yeah. I retired in 1983. Now I know you went home and you married your girlfriend. Yeah, Jeanette. Your present wife, Jeanette. Yeah. And you had a family? Yeah. How many kids? Five. 
and you lived in New Britain your entire life? I had four boys and one girl. Did you join any veterans organizations? I belong to the VFW. Do you know a post? The one here in New Britain? Yeah. Post 911, 511, or something like that. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war? School didn't take it, thinking. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war? In which way? In, in any way. Well, it influenced me in a way where I appreciated that I got back. I, I got back in one piece. But then, thinking about my hearing, that throws everything off. Now I, I, uh, I'm an old man and I freeze a lot. Cold, it's cold in here. I'm cold. I freeze. No. How did your service and your military experience affect your life? We know well, you I, 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 I really liked it and I, I was sorry to get out right away, but It, it, it was happening too fast, and after it happened, we missed it, everybody. In other words, it was this, our reunions together, we always mentioned the fact that we did so much in so little of a time. But then, we're in war, we'll never stop being in war. And you know, it, it, it scares me to to think about that. To think about our men going into service and they're getting killed left and right. And they don't have a chance in a, li in a, in a lifetime to, to be normal people. They can't be. They're gonna... The U.S. government, in order to stay free, we have to put them where we want them, where we need them. And this is intelligent people are getting killed, you know? Albert, is there anything else that you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? Gee, I couldn't tell you right now. <laughs> You may think of stuff later. Yeah. I'd like to thank you for your service to our country and thank you for your interview. Oh, thank you. These are Albert D'Amico's medals from World War II, which will be recorded on his records.